The following program has been edited down from its original length and comes from the DVD Dino Hunter, Discovering Dinosaur Soft Tissue. Visit us today to obtain the whole program. I think our evolutionary colleagues have done a really good job of preconditioning the general public to the idea that these are ancient organisms and they're not contemporaries of man. A straightforward reading of the scripture would tell us that dinosaurs are contemporary of man. We've been told by secular scientists dinosaurs died out over 65 million years ago. Yet almost by accident, paleontologist Mary Schweitzer discovered soft dinosaur tissue inside a T-Rex bone. I think the general public wasn't ready and hadn't considered the fact that there might be soft tissue vessels and red blood cells or even proteins or collagen or DNA in anything that old. I think the average person went, wait, what? I'm in the Hell Creek Formation in eastern Montana, and it was here that a discovery was made about dinosaurs that rocked the world. We've been told by secular scientists dinosaurs died out over 65 million years ago. Yet almost by accident, paleontologist Mary Schweitzer discovered soft dinosaur tissue inside a T-Rex bone. How could dinosaur soft tissue have survived for that long? There seems to be no solid mechanism in place to preserve soft tissue for millions of years. But there may be another explanation that makes more sense. The Bible presents the idea that man and all the animals were created recently, only about 6,000 years ago. Then a global flood inundated the world about 4,300 years ago. Many scientists believe the creation and flood accounts are just a myth, yet a growing number of experts are reconsidering their worldview and beginning to believe the biblical account. A part of this rogue group of scientists is Mark Armitage, a member of the Creation Research Society. He took keen interest in Mary Schweitzer's work and set off to find his own dinosaur tissue in the Hell Creek Formation. Most people have the general impression that dinosaurs are ancient organisms. And I think our evolutionary colleagues have done a really good job of preconditioning the general public to the idea that these are ancient organisms and they're not contemporaries of man by any stretch. In fact, when the AIG Answers in Genesis Creation Museum came online, the big ridicule moment was the fact that they had Adam and Eve in the animatronic uh, display right next to a moving dinosaur. And of course, everybody went nuts over that. The account in Genesis says that all the great creatures were made contemporary with man. And then when you look in the book of Job, what do you think about behemoth? What do you think about Leviathan? And the way God describes them, they're obviously dinosaurian type creatures. And so a straightforward reading of the scripture would tell us that dinosaurs are contemporary of man. I think the general public wasn't ready and hadn't considered the fact that there might be soft tissue vessels and red blood cells or even proteins or collagen or DNA in anything that old. Not only the general public weren't ready for that, but I think the paleontologists themselves weren't ready for it. You throw a chicken bone out in the front yard by mistake or on purpose, and you come out the next day and it's picked clean. That's the very next day. And so to assume that in a thousand years, you know, there still might be soft tissue inside of it, or 10,000 years, or even 100,000 years, 
would stretch the credulity of any common person on the street. So when 65 million or supposedly 65 million year old dinosaur material was recovered, opened, and found to contain soft tissue, I think the average person went, wait, what? Could it be that scientists that hold to naturalism need to re-examine their view of history and believe in the biblical account of a recent creation and a global flood? The discovery of soft tissue in dinosaur bones seems to challenge popular beliefs with many scientists. What is the truth? Which record of Earth's history is correct? That's what we're here to find out. Dinosaurs, they have fascinated us for generations. From young to old, through movies and media, dinosaurs have captured everyone's imagination. Museums around the world present these creatures as ancient. The long periods of time between dinosaurs and humans are a part of the theory of evolution, or naturalism. Everything happened by chance and selective processes. There is no creator. Billions of years ago, amoebas changed into lower life forms. Through mutations and long periods of time, creatures changed from one to the next. The theory is presented as fact, and anyone who calls it into question is considered a lunatic or fanatic. Scientists that hold to naturalism believe that creatures evolved into dinosaurs roughly 235 million years ago. Then dinosaurs disappeared in a cataclysmic event 65 million years ago. All we find today are their bones in sedimentary layers. Some complete skeletons, but mostly they're scattered among certain layers of strata. Theories abound as to why dinosaurs are no longer with us. Meteor impacts, change in their food supply, regional floods, but none seem to completely fit the evidence. Paleontologists around the world seek answers about dinosaurs. They spend countless hours exploring rock layers to find the next big dinosaur fossil, or even a new species. The goal of most paleontologists is to carefully excavate dinosaur fossils, prepare them for transport back to the lab, then, once back in the lab, cast and rebuild these skeletons for presentations in museums. Because of the assumed age of the bones, finding soft dinosaur tissue wasn't considered worthy of study. Then, almost by accident, a paleontologist soaked a T-Rex bone in a solution to dissolve the petrified bone. And what was left shook the world. In 1991, Mary Schweitzer was studying thin slices of bone from a T-Rex. She presented her slides to a colleague who identified some of the materials as red blood cells. Not wanting to jump to any conclusions, she called them red blood cell-like microstructures. As a scientist, she was motivated to study the subject further. At first it was hard to believe because of what is known about the decomposition of dinosaur soft tissue. It just can't last up to 65 million years. She began to wonder about how soft tissue could be preserved over millions of years. She was still thinking in terms of an evolutionary worldview, long periods of time. She never considered a biblical worldview of a few thousand years. It's just not seen as a viable option by most in the scientific community. Then in 2000, a very large T-Rex was being unearthed in the Hell Creek Formation. And apparently, as they jacketed the bones, which is what they do in paleontology, you wrap the bones and put plaster of Paris around them and then roll them over and completely jacket them for removal. Well, apparently the femur that they found, the long bone, was too heavy to be helicoptered out. And so they decided to fracture it at the site. And apparently some of the pieces Mary just sort of UPSed to her lab in North Carolina and others to other labs. She immediately decalcified the bones before she started working with them. Now, that's not a technique that is usually employed by strict paleontologists. 
but she put them through this decalcification process, which actually removes away the bone mineral. So the magnesium, calcium, phosphorus, stuff like that gets etched away by the acid. And what you're left with is any materials that might be inside that are not bone mineral. Well, in the case of the bone that she found, the T-Rex bone, there were soft vessels, blood vessels, laying in the containers after the bone was fully decalcified. So they repeated it and over and over again, they came up with the same result, soft tissue. So she published this in Science. She had multiple papers published. She went out looking for other uh, dinosaur, taxa, other genera, species and repeated it and found soft tissue over and over and over again. And so this was in the literature now for a period of three or four years in major journals like Science. This is not a process that paleontologists normally use because they could not believe that dinosaur soft tissue would exist in a 65 million year old bone. The scientific community went wild with this new discovery and a huge controversy arose. Some doubted it was even dinosaur tissue, but was instead a type of film made by microbes that had contaminated the specimen after it was buried. One of the big uh, counter arguments, answers to her work, was these are in fact biofilms. A biofilm is actually sort of a sticky, gelatinous residue that's left over after microbes, whether those are bacteria or fungi or other organisms, go in and decompose the soft tissue that's in the bone. Now the contention was that this biofilm actually replicated the structures that were being eaten by these microorganisms. That takes this ooze that they're spitting out after they're eating the nutrients and that ooze goes in and somehow replicates what they just ate. That's not possible, but that was the big argument. Then in 2005, other T-Rex soft tissue was found and compared to the first sample. They matched. Mary and others were perplexed because no known mechanism can preserve soft, stretchy tissue for millions of years. When news came out about the soft tissue, those who hold to a young earth belief, as presented in the Bible, felt like the soft tissue was an incredible find to support their worldview. Many scientists just could not buy into this idea. Even Mary, a member of the Assemblies of God, does not believe in a young earth, or that the Genesis account is even true. So instead of questioning her worldview about the age of the earth, Mary and her team went to work to try and find out how tissue could have been preserved for millions of years. And so I think that she's rather looking for the mechanism that could have preserve these tissues over time. Whatever mechanism that is, I suspect that that's probably the direction they're gonna to wanna to go in to find out why, how were these things preserved? Not wanting to concede that the young earth creationists were right, she tried several experiments and found that iron could be a preserving agent. Her experiments included soaking soft tissue in an iron rich solution. Over a period of two years, she found that the tissue soaked in the iron-rich solution didn't decay nearly as much as those samples without the solution. But successfully preserving soft tissue for two years is a lot different than 65 million years, which makes these experiments inconclusive. Even preserving the soft tissue in iron-rich blood for several thousand years seems like a stretch. Answers to these mysteries are being researched by other scientists. An answer may soon provide the explanation for how these tissues have been so well preserved. Could it be that dinosaurs just aren't as old as mainline science has led us to believe? The young earth theory has to be explored as a viable option. This program is brought to you by Awesome Science Media, an organization committed to producing high quality science focused television content, all from a biblical worldview. Be sure to sign up for our email newsletter to find out about our new titles and get deals on our content. To learn more about who we are, visit our website and online store at awesomesciencemedia.com. You can now get access to all of our programming on our video-on-demand platform at awesomesci.tv.com with a low monthly subscription rate of $4.99. 
And for a limited time, the first seven days are free, so you can check us out before you commit. Subscribe today and get access to every episode and documentary we have produced. Not only will you get access to all of our programs, but every behind the scenes video, blooper reels, interview clips, scientist testimony, producer video blog, on-site production previews, and spherical production videos. Awesome Sci TV will also be the place where we release our newest content, so you'll be the first in the world to see our newest episodes and documentaries. We're always producing content, so new titles will be added as soon as we release them. No matter where you live on the globe, if you have internet, you can subscribe to Awesome Sci TV. So what are you waiting for? Check us out today. Sign up for a seven-day trial. You'll have the choice to sign up for our monthly package or save money by signing up for our yearly subscription. But if you don't want to subscribe, Awesome Sci TV also offers each title for rent or for purchase. View our content from our website or download it to your computer or mobile device when you purchase it. It's easy to access any of our titles. Get all of our great programming and build up your faith in God's Word. Remember, for a limited time, you can sign up for a seven-day free trial. Go to AwesomeSciTV.com to sign up now. Mark Armitage, a microscopy specialist, decided to take his belief a step further and challenge the old age theory. Mark didn't grow up as a Christian. In fact, through much of his early life, he was a strong believer in evolution. Even though I was, I was a very religious person, I was brought up in a religious family, there was no relationship between me and God. I knew only his edicts and his judgments and that I had to stay in line or I was going to get zapped, you know. <laughs> so, but I was an evolutionist. I was a trained evolutionist at the University of Florida. And so when I became a Christian, I dragged that evolution into my Christianity with me. I was deeply troubled because I couldn't reconcile what I knew to be true from my training with what I was reading in Scripture. And not just the Old Testament, the things that Jesus was saying. He said, at the beginning, the Creator made the male and female. And I would read that and say, well, wait a minute, Jesus. Maybe it's because you weren't educated, but then, okay, but you're God, right? So I was really confused because I thought, why would Jesus tell us something which scientifically I knew not to be true? I was bothered by it all the time and I was really glad when nobody talked about it because I didn't have to deal with it. It was so troubling to me I just put it in the background until I came across creation materials. I was really hungry for that because I knew this was an unanswered question for me and so I really devoured those creation materials to try to gain an understanding. As Mark grew in his faith and understanding about how science and the Bible agree, he started speaking at creation science meetings and homeschool conventions. Mark finished his master's degree in biology at the Institute for Creation Research, as well as a master's degree in science education at Liberty University, then started his career in microscopy. He also used his expertise for scientific research, writing many papers on his findings. Other creation scientists began searching him out for help on their research projects. During this time, he became a board member of the Creation Research Society. The Creation Research Society is a society of scientists, scientists who have advanced degrees, mostly masters and PhD level, who are committed to a literal young earth, recent creation, and a God who designed all life. When news of Mary's discovery came out, Mark was captivated and decided to start his own research. I looked carefully at the interviews, I scoured online what was available, and then I downloaded Mary Schweitzer's papers and I read the papers. And the protocols were very easy for me to implement. There was a couple of things that I had to learn about, uh, particularly the EDTA, which is the, the weak acid that the bones are dissolved in. But I had done some decalcification before and so I thought, wow, this is a project that I could do that we could do uh, with the CRS. Wow, what if we find soft tissue? Because he took the Bible literally, he believed in the young age of Earth and that most fossils were formed during the worldwide flood. Mark hypothesized that dinosaur soft tissue was much more prevalent in the fossil record than everyone had thought. Because the bones were only a few thousand years old, they should be easy to find. 
I tend to think that soft tissue in dinosaur remains and probably in most remains in the fossil record contain soft tissue. I really think that's the norm and the exception. And I would like to go out and prove that. Mark proposed to the CRS that a research project be established to find soft tissue in the Hell Creek Formation. Mark and the research team came up with iDino for the project name, which stands for the Investigation of Dinosaur Intact Natural Osteo Tissue. After formalizing the research project and getting funding, it was time to go searching for a sample. I didn't really know where to start. I was very happy when my colleague said, why don't you contact Otis Klein? This is a site that's free and clear owned by Otis and his foundation. And so we weren't gonna be collecting on government land. I asked Otis if he could, in his travels throughout the site, because he has people come from time to time and they do week long digs and such. Would he be so kind as to look for a long bone? Sure, no problem. But he never found one. And so I thought, well, why don't we take a different approach? So we selected a time period, we went up there, we interfaced with Otis. When these bones are exposed on the surface, they're highly weathered. This is in the badlands of Montana, so very harsh conditions. The winter's cold and long, a lot of wind, a lot of erosion, a lot of water, snow action. And so the bones found on the surface or just, just below the surface are really of poor quality. And so we looked at those and we took them, we thought, well, okay, we'll try those, but we're not very hopeful of what we'd find. We drove up as far as we could drive in the truck, and then we had to get out and hike for a while through these badland hills. And we got up to the top of a hill, and there was a Triceratops uh, horn portion. It was about the size of a large coffee can in width and depth. It had these wonderful ridges all the way around it where the bone and the keratin that was once there met. But it was hard as a rock and very heavy. It was covered in lichens, orange and yellow lichens. It was very beautiful, so we left it. Uh, but we said, no, that's probably not gonna work for us. And then we were kind of kicking around and just below the horn where the, the brow turned into sort of a cliff, Marge, the ranch owner, noticed something sticking out of the side of the cliff. She kind of said, well, I think that's a Triceratops horn. So we started digging, and of course we were kind of hanging on the side of the cliff as we were digging, and then later we were laying down on our stomachs, leaning over the cliff. So finally we got the whole thing excavated, and it looked intact. It was obviously the horn of an adult Triceratops, whether male or female, we don't know. We did send one piece for carbon-14 dating, and the date came back within about 40 to 43,000 years. Mark's next step was to prepare parts of the horn for examination under the electron microscope. I started making thin sections, and usually the first sections that you get, you don't find anything right away. That's typically how it goes. Then all of a sudden, these little osteocytes started to show up in the tissue. Osteocytes are cells that help rebuild bone material. They usually only live as long as the bone is alive. So the fact that they are still found in dinosaur bone is remarkable. In addition to the osteocytes that we found in the scanning electron microscope, which were thrilling to see, there were other features in the dinosaur bones that really stood out to us. The high degree of permineralization in some of the vessels where you could tell the walls were hard, solid, crystalline material that were laying in the vessels over the time they became fossilized. Some of them are round. They look like actual red blood cells. And so we called them blood cell-like objects in our paper, just the way Mary Schweitzer did. But others of them are crystallized in beautiful crystalline form. In addition to this high degree of permineralization that we saw, we also saw, for example, in the fractured ribs of the Triceratops, beautiful thin vessels sticking out of the center of what we call Haversian systems. And so it was really neat to see some of the vessels in the fractured bone extending out just thin wisps of soft vessel in this hard bone. That was very rewarding. 
Could it be that true science is being stalled on soft dinosaur tissue because of the prevailing secular worldview? Perhaps the explanation that makes the most sense, a recent creation and global flood, is the real story to explain dinosaur soft tissue. There is scientific evidence to show that you don't have to throw your brain out to become a Christian. You don't have to give up logic and understanding and science to accept the God of the Bible, to place your life in His hands, and to trust Him for daily life now and for life in eternity. So it's a great message. We've got the best message going. So why does God let me find these things and look at these things and discover these things? I don't know, it's exhilarating. I give Him all the praise and the glory for it. Hi, I'm Kyle Justice of Awesome Science Media. I'm glad you're watching our programs. I hope you've been ministered to. Some of you might feel called to give towards our ministry to help us produce even more great programming. I'm going to show you how. We've tried to be creative in the way we partner with our viewers, so we've set up a special producer's website just for you. Similar to crowdfunding, we have partnered with Patreon, a site that helps support us as content creators on a monthly basis. By giving, you become a producer with us. As a thank you for your support, we have set up several rewards depending upon how much you'd like to give. From exclusive access to extra content, a first look at our new programs, behind the scenes specials, to special one-on-one -on -one monthly hangouts with our hosts and experts, we want to thank you in some big ways. So here's how it works. Go to our website at awesomesciencemedia.com and select the special Become a Producer icon at the top. You can watch the introduction video first. Then on the right, you'll see various giving levels and what rewards you'll receive. Pick one and the website will lead you through the sign-up process. Then more than once a month, you'll get email notifications when the rewards are available. You can even give as little as $1 a month. By becoming one of our producers, you'll be able to help us produce even more great programming every month. We'll reach the world with the message of our great creator. Thank you for your help and support. We look forward to partnering with you. The search for dinosaur soft tissue goes on. The controversy over long and short ages will continue, which leaves us with more work to do. See you next time on Dino Hunter.